All right, welcome back, all 46 of you all. Um, we will continue with the components of the distribution system in which we've made our way up to valves. We talked about the various types of lines, main lines, service lines. So now we're going to talk about valves. How many of you all know without a doubt where every single valve in your system is? <laughs> Got a few hands, super. Small, small system, huh? Brand new. Okay, second question. How many of you all, on a routine basis, at least once a year, exercise all the valves in your system? Oh, still got one. Very good, very good. How many of us should know where our valves are? <laughs> How many of us should be exercising our valves routinely? Yeah, so we got lots of work to do. What's the purpose of a valve? Control flow, pressure, direction, isolation. Very good. And that's what we're going to talk about. The most common type of isolation valve is the gate valve. Cool. So valves are used to isolate or cut off parts of the system, gate valve being one of the most common ones. There are also a second function of valves that we're going to use for control. Control the direction of flow, the pressure, regulate the pressure, um, the flow rate. There are several types of valves that are out there. We have our slide valves, we have rotary valves, we have diaphragm, we have globe valves, we have special valves. What do we mean by special valves? There's no operating element, no separate. The operated, the operated element happens to be the actual fluid that we are moving or that's moving. All right, the purpose of valves is to control water flow. Method uh, is based on the classification. Uh, they are classified either as uh, by function, isolation or control, or by design. Isolation valve. What type of valve is this right here? It is a gate valve. Very good. Uh, isolation valves will prohibit or permit flow. Um, they can be closed or open. Now I'm going to go out on a limb here. And I say go out on a limb, like they say. Gate valves are not designed to be throttled. You all agree with that? Then why do we do it? It's easy, it works, huh? But again, you're compromising that gate in there in the process of doing that. Um, most are distribution valves. In other words, you have valves at the plant, you have valves in the distribution system itself. Um, ample, ample repair supply without undue interruption. In other words, it will allow you to go in there, isolate area, um, instead of putting your whole, your, all your customers out of service, you're able to isolate. Um, your cone or ball valve is the most uh, common service line valve. All right, our control valves regulate pressure, volume, flow direction. Now, this valve is designed or can be throttled. Uh, if you have a control valve, the sole purpose behind it. Various types, we have the globe, the altitude, check valves, uh, diaphragm, and the rotary. Now, on this one here, I have issue with that being a control valve. Uh, in this area here, although it can be, but it's normally listed under our special valves there. Altitude valves, where do we find those? Okay, in our tanks to help regulate that water level there. All right, check valves. We have swinging flap um, check valves, controls the flow in one direction. In other words, as that water is flowing through, that check opens. And when the water tries to reverse, the check does what? Closes and does not permit the flow of water. Check valves are installed on the discharge side of the pipe in order to prevent the water from flowing backwards when the pumps are off. 
Uh, if they are installed on the suction side, now they are termed foot valves, and the whole purpose is to help maintain prime in your centrifugal pumps. Ah, that's a big one there. Swinging arm that can be weighted. All right, we have automatic control valves, altitude being one such, and a lot of people will argue on that because when you talk about the automatic control valves, these are the ones that will operate without any human intervention and uh, as long as there are certain things that are going on. These are set or adjusted by differential pressure. We have pressure operating valves that can be uh, globe valves and again reduce pressure by restricting the flow. It's another type there. And then air release valves set at high points in the system, release trapped air, float and lever uh, type of arrangements can be the makeup. Here's another one. Now, they are also classified by design. Um, we already said function, isolation, control, by the design of the valve itself. When you look at a valve, you're looking at four components or four parts to the valve. We have the body, we have the movable element, we have the operator of the movable elements, and you have connections. For instance, this um, little wheel here, which part is it? Operator. Operator of the movable element. Excellent. Where's the movable element? The gate itself. Yeah, super. And again, by design, we have slide, slide valves, as this is a slide valve, the gate valve is a slide valve, simply operates up and down in order to either open position, it leaves this flowway open where water permits the flow of water. In a closed position, of course, there is no flow. Uh, now, is this a rising or non-rising stem? Non-rising non stem. Now, with your slide valves, again, they can be rising or non-rising. If it's an application below ground, we don't need to know if that valve is up. Well, there's no way if it's below ground to see whether or not it's open or closed. For the purpose of the rising and non-rising, if it were a rising stem, then I can tell just by observation if that valve is open or closed by the position of the stem. Non-rising stems, I can't tell if it's open or closed, so I'm looking for some type of indicator on that valve in order to let me know whether or not it's open or closed. Okay, rotary valves, how do they differ from slide valves? Yeah, the butterfly is a type of rotary valve, very good. How does it differ? Oh, okay, so I can make a 90 degree turn to open or close a rotary valve. Excellent. Huh? A ball valve, super. Cone valve, excellent. How many turns does it take to open a slide valve? Depends on the, depends on what? So the stem and the rise, the gate height. Repeat what you said. Depends on the size of the valve. Depends on the size of the valve. Three times the valve size plus or minus two is what we go by. So if we have an eight inch valve, how many turns does it take? Okay, super, 24, 26 area there. If I have a 96 inch valve, <laughs> that's an all day. How many guys does it take? That's why, right, that's why when you have these very huge mains and things like that, putting a slide valve in there for isolation is almost murder. Okay. That's why, again, rotary valves are much more acceptable because it doesn't take as much turns. One of the drawbacks to that, however, is when I open this valve, it's either all the way open or all the way closed. There is nothing to impede the flow. If I have a butterfly valve, no matter how I open it, guess what? There is something always in the flow way 
which is going to, again, give me friction. So that slide, rotary globe. Um, globe is um, your common household faucet is a globe valve, so like a flexible material, uh, similar to the diaphragm. The difference between the globe and the diaphragm, your diaphragm has the flexible material attached to the body framework of the valve. The globe valve, it's attached to the movable element within itself. Special valve, we'll look at those too. All right, so gate valves or slide valves designs, we have single disc, we have double disc, we have resilient wedge. How many of you all still have a lot of the double disc in your system? Still? What about resilient wedge? Single disc? Don't know? Huh? I didn't see many hands. You have what? Well, I, I used to run a water plant. We had resilient wedge valves. Okay. Yeah, more and more you get longer service, better seal out of those. Uh, here with the metal to metal, you may have leakage, and it's acceptable. Um, with resilient wedge, again, with that type of material that's on that gate, it gives you a better compression. Um, your single disc can be used in medium-sized lines. And here, as I said, um, keep in mind that there is an allowable amount of leakage with the single or double disc valve that's allowed. Um, double disc mainline with resilient wedge gate valves is why they use. Uh, it's been the industry standards for. Now they say over 100 years. In the 70s and 80s, there was the introduction of resilient wedge. And a lot of people, when they change it out, especially of the smaller to medium sized line, this is the type of valve to go with. Um, and it's more economical also. I'm pretty sure none of you all have lines and valves that look like that, right? Yeah. Uh, another thing with your slide valves, they can have rising or non-rising stem. Again, with the rising stem, it indicates that the valve is open. Lord stem, the valve is um, closed. And usually you will find these in above ground application. Non-rising stem, underground installation, um, turns required to open or close. Again, typically three, as we said, three times the valve size plus or minus two. Larger diameter valves should be designed with small bypass on them. It's a big one there, huh? 40H. Another type of slide is a sluice gate. Is this a rising or non-rising stem? Rising, very good. Um, again, the movable element is the gate itself. Um, suitable for low pressure application only, so you're looking at treatment plants going from basin to basin. Here again, open or close? Low, low pressure application only. Shear gate, here, these are designed to go on a pipe. Uh, low pressure seating at the pipe end, play covering the opening. It's rotated on a hinge typically, operated by pull rod, but low pressure only. Still the gate. So those would be your slide valves. Now rotary valves, again, the beauty of these is that with a 90 degree turn, you can open or close them. The butterfly valve, which is the one that's uh, shown here, uh, is a rotary valve, but as you can see, even in the open position, it's still some restriction in the, the flow way of that pipe. So the disc attached to a stem to block or allow flow, it usually it's operated by a right angle gear, it remains in the flow way at all times, however there should be resilient, um, resistant material around that to cause a bubble type seal when closed. But 
in the event that you get some crud or something once you open it, it can be very, very difficult to get that seal. Or there could be tuberculation in that pipe that cuts that resilient wedge material. Again, it's not going to give you the bubble tight seal. All right, large um, butterfly valves are used in large diameter high pressure mains. Uh, you have differential pressure that's occurring there. And again, hydraulic or electric power uh, can be used in order on those larger valves. Another rotary valve is the cone valve. Here you can see the cone element, and there's an orifice that's cut. And again, a 90 degree turn will open. If this is um, in the path of the, in the position of the flowway, it will be open, but a quick turn like that will be closed. Used for small service lines, remember the comb, the ball valves are typically used, um, such as with your corporation stop, curb stops, or meter stops. They have the ball valve, very similar to the comb valve, except now you have a spear um, instead of the comb there. Again, it will allow or restrict or stop flow, and you have the orifice there in order to do that. Um, the body is made or coated with Teflon, again, used for your service lines. Now, globe valves, a little different. We have here flat or tapered disc that's attached to the movable element. It can operate wide range of pressure and flow setting. Um, an adaptation of the globe valve, but when I need much, much, much more, let's say, uh, control, the needle valve is a variation uh, in which, again, it's designed where it's pointed in a needle. Um, so when I'm dealing with uh, rotometers, chlorine cylinders, and things like that, it may be the needle valve because I have greater control there. Diaphragm um, valve, flexible material that's actually attached to the body of the valve itself by um, lowering and opening that stem will seal it in order to close the flow or allow the flow to flow. Um, no packing glands with this and it's suitable for hazardous liquid. So in the process of determining what type of application valves, lines that you're going to have, someone needs to be looking at all of this. What's in my material? And hopefully, since we're all dealing with potable water, we don't have hazardous liquids. But if I need to feed chlorine, chlorine dioxide, again, it's going to cause for very specific types of valve in order to give long service. Now, because this is flexible material, over time, what's going to happen to the diaphragm? It's going to wear out. Yeah. And if I have dry periods like that too, it's going to make it start to crack and all. So I may have to replace that from time to time. So there should be some type of maintenance even on valves, I submit to you. There are special valves. These do not fit in other uh, classification. The reason being is there's no operator of the movable element other than the substance that we are, are moving. Uh, and some of them will use water to operate their element. Uh, so if you think of the check valve earlier, as that water flows, it's the water that opens the check or closes the check. It's not a lever, it's not a stem or anything like that. Um, so the different types of special valves, swing check valve, silent check valve, relief valves are all types of uh, special valves. The pinch valve would be a special valve. Okay. All right, maintenance. Um, first of all, in that picture, do you all see anything interesting? We hadn't gotten to that particular part of the distribution system, but the hydrant is black, which means what? It's not listed as treating it Okay. Mm -hmm. what, what do you say? It's not at capacity. Something's wrong with it. Out-of-service hydrants are generally painted black. 
However, some people use manipulation and paint them black so they're not ensuring that it will produce so many gallons per minute so when the firemen come out there, they're not like saying, hey, you have adequate flow. So, and that's a dangerous game to play. Okay. We're going to talk about them next. Now, underground main uh, line valves should be operated how often, they suggest? Annually, annually. But part of the problem, a lot of them are missing in action. So there should be some type of valve and hydrant maintenance program in place where you've identified all your valves, you numerated all your valves, you're going through, you're exercising them. If you are at a treatment plant, the suggestion then is quarterly. Why? You don't have as many. So why not? You know where they are, if they're above ground and if they're at your treatment plant. All right, so what are some of the typical procedures for exercising? First of all, locate them. Now, if they're not on my map, how do I go about locating them? Say what? Metal detectors. Metal detectors can be used, okay. Yeah. GPS, wow, and we are there. Yes, we are there. But before I use the GPS when I'm putting them in, I need to make sure what? Huh? Yeah. So how many of your maps are up to date? That's one thing. Tanner, we're going to take a trip to your location. That's the ideal location so we can all get it right. Um, so we got to locate them, and part of your maintenance program is going through there, putting them on the maps and loading them up so we can uh, utilize computers and things that are available. The other thing is the setting of the valves. How often are we going out to make sure, again, they are correctly aligned? We have uh, poured some concrete in there in order to make sure that we are minimizing misalignment as much as possible um, and that they are properly marked. Now, do you all use any type of reflective paint where your valves are, water valves, um, such as painting the sidewalk blue or your nothing like that, or putting a reflector? A marker? Yeah. But that's something you can think about, not just when you, someone needs to dig, but just going through the system and putting some identifying mark where your valves are so they can be easily, readily noticeable. Close the valve, open it fully. Uh, turn the operating nut in closing position and then um, go ahead and start to generate your work orders if necessary for repairs um, and record the data because if it's not recorded, it wasn't done. So make sure you document, document, document. And you're going to open, close, one-fourth, one-half in order to make sure you're getting rid of anything that may be in there. All right, cavitation. We talked about water hammer. And when we talked about water hammer, I heard someone talk about air, air. What is cavitation and how does it differ from, from water ha hammer? I didn't address it at that point, but I heard the air. Okay, and Dan says cavitation can occur when there's inadequate water and you are getting those air pockets in there? Uh, either high temperature water, insufficient suction head on the, the basically cavitation is the formation of steam bubbles on the back side of the blades of the, of the uh, Okay. The and we have an engineering standpoint here where again all those things can cause cavitation now we have the air va vapors. Did you all bring me lunch? Sure. Coming back so late. Now we have all these air pockets, and what starts to happen is what? 
start collapsing, what's that going to do to my impeller? Yeah, eat it away, pit it out. Now what happens to my efficiency? <laughs> big, 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 big drop there. So, uh, continuous exposure can des destroy a valve body when you have cavitation occurring. Um, I thought I had another slide in there that actually, I guess I didn't show the actual, what the valve looked like when there's lots of cavitation. Maybe it's with the pump that I remember seeing that. All right, cool. Questions on valves. So valves are classified either by function or design to recap. And by function, what are the, the two major functions of valves? Control and isolation. By design, you have slide valves, you have rotary valves, you have special globe diaphragm. Excellent. Now I think it's your time to see how well we did on this. All right, I need you to determine, we have a knife valve here, the design classification. Remember design classification was slide, rotary, diaphragm, globe, or special. So, slide, okay. Let's see, is that correct? Ah, yay, got it right, cool. Now, the second classification with slide valves, we looked at whether or not it was a rising or a non-rising stem. Is this one rising or non-rising? Very, very good. And again, you can see again, there's a little there, there's a little opening there. Excellent. Oh, we have a pinch valve here. Pinch valve, well, if I tell you that, then I will tell you what the classification. I was about to tell you how it worked. But what's the design classification? Think of your esophagus. How does your esophagus work? When you eat food. Now even with the diaphragm, remember I still have the moving element uh, and the operator of the moving element. But with your esophagus, think of the digestive process. You swallow and it goes down, or think of a snake that's just eaten at lunch. Okay, so we're going to put it as a special. It's the actual movement of the food or the liquid that operates. And essentially what happens as the water goes in and opens up, and then as the water moves through, it closes and it forces the water on through. So it's a pinch valve operates like that. Um, it is sort of like the diaphragm type material, but since we don't have a lever or anything like that to open or to close, that's why it falls under the special. All right, we have the resilient wedge gate valve, the design classification. Slide, very good. Secondary? Yeah, it's a slide. Is it rising or non-rising? Super. The altitude valve. Ah, the globe. Because it's attached to the actual stem itself. All right, butterfly. Hmm? I heard slot, I heard globe, I heard. Very good. Check valve. And this is a slant. Hmm? Super special. It's the water that acts as the, and yeah, you can have, again, um, springs and things to kind of help, but basically it's the movement of the water. Spring check. Special, hint, all of your check valves will fall into the special. Sluice gate, slide, 
Secondary classification? Excellent. Air release valve. Very good. Someone was listening. Was it, oh, plug valve. I'm like, okay, how many of these we got to go through? But at least you get to see all the different valves. I like the first one better. Rotary. Yeah, because we're turning this right here, open or close. All right, we've seen these. These are slide, and I guess here was different is the non-rising stem classification. Fire hydrant, which will lead us into our next segment uh, as far as components of the distribution system. Very good. All right, any questions on valves? None? Y'all are an easy crowd. All right, the fire hydrant. What is the purpose of the fire hydrant? Okay, yes, ma'am, Lisa? I never seen this at a At a wastewater treatment plant, you can use it there. Um, pinch valves are used mainly when you have all kinds of big stuff that whereas other valves would clog, you don't get the clogging with pinch valves. So where you have lots of, I guess, crud and stuff. Yeah, solids, that's a good word for it. <laughs> solids, pinch valves can be used. Huh? They use them on grit chambers. Grit chambers. Yeah, wastewater. Okay. Good question. All right, uh, distribution system, the hydrant. What's the main purpose of the hydrant? Flushing mains. Flushing mains. Huh? Supply, supply water? Hmm, interesting. Main purpose of the hydrant, why it was put in place, was to put out fires. Put out fires. In the early years, how was this accomplished? Very good, fire plugs. Those were one of the first uh, instances of fire hydrants. Literally, as he said, they dug the hole and they've actually found wooden pipes, you know, that had the, hugs, the holes dug out and they just simply put it back in and put a marker where that was so the next time there was a fire incident, and I don't know how many, but traveling around the country, I get to go to quite a few museums and almost it never fails, the initial cities burn down for whatever reason, it's like whole cities burn down. So when there was a fire the second time, it was again that place to go back there and take that little cobblestone out and put out fires. Then after that it progressed to, do you know what they used for insulation with some of the earlier hydrants that were above ground? Huh? Not asbestos, we're talking 1800s, which was quite interesting because we're talking pot of a water. Manure, manure. So I'm like, oh wow, talk about cross connection. <laughs> But the main purpose of hydrants, firefighting, um, we use it in our industry for water, uh, bad water dequality complaints. Get out there, when you get a bad call for bad water, flush it out, usually it can take care of it. Um, air bleeding, bleeding air from the mains after construction. I don't care how careful you are and leave that water running, you're going to get some air in the mains. So again, 1800s, we had fire plugs, and this is actually a wooden wire right wrap log here uh, where they just literally cut holes off, put their connection there, put out the fire, knew exactly where to go back to it. Now, I often show pictures, and, and the reason being a lot of times is not to show the right thing, but the improper thing. Do you see anything wrong with that hydrant? No. Yeah. yeah. How many of your hydrants are in that situation there? 
Uh, do you think that the firemen can be able to get a 360 turn on that nozzle? <laughs> He's got a shovel first. So again, this would not be one that's up to grade for putting out a fire. Um, so for firefighting, for flushing and testing the system, and to provide water for municipal use. This one here, not so much nowadays since 9-11. Prior to 9-11, any and everybody probably opened the hydrants at their leisure, uh, especially if you're talking about um, the people who maintain the grounds and things like Landscapers, they didn't think much about opening a hydrant. You do it now in Texas, you will incur a fine. Yeah, you cannot. We have locks on ours. You put locks on yours, okay? Anybody else utilize locks? You all do? Excellent, excellent. And to provide water temporarily for contractors. But the main purpose, of course, is uh, for fire services. Now, the water system must make sure that you ensure you have adequate fire flow. Go back earlier on one of the earlier slides, it says between 500 and 12,000 gallons per minute, right? Um, adequate pressure also, uh, you got to use approved pipe materials, and if you're going to put a hydrant, there should be at least a minimum of a six inch main. Hydrant should not go on main sizes that are smaller. And I know today we're not putting in any mains with smaller, but there are some cities that still have two inch, four inch mains out there. But all hydrants should be placed on a minimum of a six inch main. And proper operation and maintenance of hydrants is also critical. Now we said with our valves, we're going to exercise them how often? Once a year. With hydrants, the recommendation is how often? Twice a year. Twice a year. Failure to do so can lead or may lead to the utility's liability for fire damage. So keep that in mind that all of this responsibility goes back to the utility. And some utilities will allow their fire department to maintain the hydrants to ensure the fire flow and all of that. Other utilities like to keep that within their own uh, ranks there. Do you all flush your dead ends? Automatic flusher is a state requirement for dead end flushing. And generally we don't see that. In Texas we do. All dead ends must be flushed monthly. You all yearly here, Arizona, yearly? Yes, no, maybe so, no? There's no requirement for dead end flushing? Just suggested, okay, recommend it again. Um, yes, sir, Jerry. Okay, can I give you a suggestion where you're not putting that chlorinated water in the ditch? It's called getting a basket and some HTH tablets or an absorbent acid, and as that water flows out of the hydrant, what's happening? Okay, dechlorinating. Yeah. Is most states require that? As far as you cannot put anything in the ditch or in the receiving stream, that will cause any harm to the aquatic life. So yes, if you're disinfection, disinfecting, you have to have something to strip the chlorine. I said HTH and none of you all even. Thank you. Sometimes I talk and I hear myself after the fact. It has to, come on, help me out. Neutralizing agent, sodium thiosulfate or something like that. I said the wrong thing. I said absorbent action can be used also. No. Well, yeah, don't let me just put that out there like that. <laughs> we were talking chlorine, that's the reason that came out. So yeah, you must, you must make sure that you are neutralizing the chlorine before you discharge that, that water. Absolutely. Another um, state had issue because of water problems. Um, 
they were in drought and so because of that the state put an ax on a lot of the flushing so there are a lot of reasons why you wouldn't flush but keep in mind when you don't employ that you may end up with uh, poor quality of water especially if that water is sitting in your lines long period of time uh, at the dead ends how often do you all test your hydrants for uh, adequate flow to make sure you have that 500 to 12,000 gallons per minute. Ever do that? Yeah, typically. Okay, or do some type of pressure testing. Cool. All right, again, hydrants are great for getting rid of red water. Uh, Dan mentioned automatic flushers. In Houston, we had to go to that mainly for water quality. And so not only did we utilize hydrants for the automatic flushers, we actually put automatic flushers in some of the lines. And they are timed, so you can set it up on timer, so you don't have an operator going out there utilizing his time. Automatically come on and flush that water to get rid of bad water complaints. All right, parts of a hydrant. The external parts, you have the operating nut, um, and you all have a, a picture in your book of this on page, Amanda? 17-10. Super. She keeps me on track. 17-10, if you want to follow along. Operating nut, we have the weather shield, um, the bonnet, the upper barrel, the pumper nozzle, the hose nozzle. What's the difference between the pumper and the hose nozzle? Size. Very good. Size. Generally, your pump or nozzle is much larger. Uh, your hose nozzle is the, usually the two and a half. I'm not even going to look in that direction. We have the ground flange. Now, with your traffic model, the, the purpose of the ground flange is to do what? Break away in order so you're not causing problems down there. Losing a lot of water. Um, the lower barrel, which we usually don't see, and that usually determines the berry of the hydrant itself, and then the hydrant shoe, uh, in which the main valve assembly is, uh, resides there. Okay. Now for lubrication, what type of... Um, Grease can I use? Okay, and I said grease for a purpose. We want to make sure the lubricant is a food grade oil. Um, the operating nut uh, is usually turned by a wrench, brass, one and one fourth inch. In Texas, we have the pentagonals, which are the five sided. Um, what do you all typically have in Arizona? The same thing? Okay, cool. Can I use a pipe wrench to open it? No, and again, in Texas, you will be fine if you don't have the proper hydrant wrench. The weather shield is in place to keep the dirt and water out. It may be part of the bonnet or hold down nut with uh, an O-ring. Okay, you see the O-ring there. We have the bonnet itself. Usually these are color coordinated. Uh, the purpose of the color of the bonnet is to let the firefighter know how many gallons per minute he can expect from this hydrant when it's operational. And that's the reason I say some utilities have started playing this game because they don't want to ensure to certify that it's gonna give that many gallons per minute. Just put, paint it black. And that way, you know, they think they're taking the liability away from them. But this right here, again, we're the protectors of the environment. So it's critical when that fireman comes out there, he knows the pressure, he knows the line size, or at least the estimated, estimated gallons per minute it can produce. So underneath that bonnet, we have the operating nut, uh, the lubricant reservoir, food grade, NSF approved, uh, as far as lubricant type. Because again, it may come in contact with your potable water. The upper barrel, and that extends uh, from the breakaway to the bonnet itself. We have the pumper nozzle. This is the larger port here, the streamer port that connects to the hydrant. 
uh, to the fire truck. Um, usually we're using national standard threads, four and a half inch diameter, the hose nozzle, uh, usually two outlets. Really with this one it can be also be two. Two and a half, uh, one is the national standard thread, brass construction. Here when we were talking about pipes in the connection, Karen was it? Yes. Okay, pointed out that some can be flanged. Here we have that uh, scenario as far as the breakaway is a flange connection uh, there. And if you will, Karen, make sure you initial the morning and the afternoon. We were looking for you early and that's how. Okay. It connects the upper and lower barrel. Traffic model is again, it's for safety. Um, it's usually not on the older hot hydrants, uh, but as people are replacing hydrants, they're going with the traffic model. And we talk about, talked about the lower barrel. The hydrant shoe um, contains the main valve assembly, connects to the main, and AWWA standard, and remember most states adopt AWWA standard, a minimum of a six inch inlet, and it's a mechanical joint, or it can be flanged. Yes, that was not for us. Someone responded. Okay, internal parts. We have the lubricating chamber. And again, it supplies oil or grease to the threaded connection uh, between the operating nut and stem. Food grade only, food grade, food grade. The operating stem, again, that operating I should wait until they finish. All right, connected to the main valve assembly, and that allows us the ability to operate it from above ground. Uh, the stem moves the main valve away from the seat or vice versa. Uh, breakaway at the ground flange also on traffic models to minimize any additional type of um, problems you may have when we hit that hydrant. Okay, we have the uh, main valve assembly, upper valve plate, main valve plate, and the uh, lower valve plate. It's a nice picture there of it. Seat ring, the bronze material that threads into the drain ring. Um, it's removed with the main valve. And then we have um, the drain ring that's threaded into cast iron shoe. On your older models, newer models, it may be fitted between the lower barrel and the shoe. And we have weep holes. What's the purpose of a weep hole? Okay. Oh, okay, very good. Now up here, do you all have wet barrels or dry barrels? Dry barrels? Super. Uh, to drain the water out of the hydrant so you don't have that freezing occurring. All right, we have flush hydrants, we have pulse hydrant. We have dry barrels, we have wet barrels. We have center stem, we have quarry. There's a lot of different types of hydrants out there on the model. So look at your application. What's the purpose of the hydrant? Look at your location. Look at your climate. That will determine a lot of these which hydrant you will have. Look at the location. For instance, a flush hydrant is one that's completely below ground in a pit, sort of like what you would do with a water meter or something like that. So where would we have flush hydrants? Airports, bridges, if you have them on bridges and things like that. 
Uh, I don't know how many bridges you all have, but in cities with lots of major bridges, and they want to put hydrants on the bridges just in case, again, flush tights, completely underground, okay? Because you don't want them to be a hazard. So at your airports and things, Pulse hydrants are those that extend at least 24 inch above the ground. A lot uh, in the United States, we deal a lot with pulse hydrants outside of, of airports and things like that. Um, then you have the dry and wet barrel. California, some part of California, Hawaii may prefer the wet barrels. Why? Because they never freeze. So they can have water in the hydrant. Other places where freezing is likely, you'll probably go with a dry barrel design. Um, Cory center stem, again, the difference, one toggles the main valve off of the center. The other one is uh, the main valve is actually attached to the center stem itself. All right, uh, with your flush hydrants, although they are below ground or below grade, they are still full service hydrants. Typical location, airport runways, bridges, industrial facilities, but still fully serviceable hydrants. Wet barrel design, uh, these are, this one happens to be a pulse wet barrel. It extends above ground, filled with water, pressurized. Each nozzle has its own valve. That's a lot of nozzles there. And again, where there's not likely the um, temperature drastic changes where freezing will occur. Dry barrels, uh, this one happens to be a center stem. Again, the barrel is dry until that main valve is open. Um, your barrel and all nozzles filled with water and your main valve closes, the water is drained out via the weep holes. Here with the quarry, as I was saying, um, this one, you hit, so like a toggle, offset the main center stem there. Um, what else? Operating that offset. The valves open with the flow on this one here. When we finish with hydrant, I'll give you all a break. I see, because usually after lunch, we need that first hour after lunch to be hitting it. So we will hit a break in a minute. All right, installation of your hydrants. Uh, again, insurance services offices, they put regulations out there or recommendations as far as where the hydrants should be placed, how far apart, um, the number of hydrants in a water system, you know what that is determined by? Property value. Residential areas, they're spaced a lot farther than in industrial commercial areas. So usually you're looking at 600 feet, 800 feet in a residential area. Minimum water main size, six inch. Uh, minimum and maximum flow rate, 500 gallons per minute to 12,000 gallons per minute. All right, again, we see the nine feet separation. Uh, and this is not, this is a standard this is not a recommendation. There are no exceptions to the rule when you're looking at hydrants and sanitary sewer lines and things like that, whereas with sanitary sewer lines and water lines, they give you that there are exceptions to the rule. Hydrants in all situation should be nine feet from any wastewater main, lateral, or service line. All right, and you want to make sure again that uh, you've installed it, vertical alignment is true, and you add a thrust block or something like that. The reason we put a thrust block back there is to do what? Make sure that that doesn't blow off when something occurs, such as water hammer. So you may want to put a thrust block behind it. Um, from time to time, you should do your hydrant flow and when in doubt and you don't know how to do it, um, you can utilize two hydrants in order to have a residual hydrant and one you're going to connect in order to get the pressure. Then you will apply this formula, the gallons per minute. This is a constant. I will refer you to Philip, he's the engineer on where these constant numbers come from. 
but we will utilize the constant 29.7 times the diameter of the nozzle, so that's two and a half squared, times the square root of the residual pressure. And again, we've connected that gauge to the hydrant so we can get what the pressure is. And the square root, just put the number in, hit the square root key on the calculator, times the coefficient of roughness. Now, how do I determine the coefficient of roughness? Look at the age of the hydrant. Uh, your newest hydrant have a 90 um, degree radius, so it's 90 percent co coefficient of roughness. Newer, which means older in this case, 80 percent, and your older hydrants will have a 70. So in essence here, they're talking about the, the friction. With the older models, your nozzle was sort of set in, and so you have to come back here and this way in order to get the flow out. And because of that friction, only 70%. With the newer hydrants, notice where the barrel is offset, but yet you still have to do like a military 90 degree turn of the water. With the newest hydrant, they've kind of curved that out, and so that reduced the friction 90%. Now, what's AWWA recommendation for color coding? Upper barrels should be white, silver, or yellow. Now, does it mean if my hydrants are not colored this way that I'm wrong? No. It goes back to what your utility want to adapt. If they want to adapt AWWA standards, great. City of Houston does not. They color code theirs based on their line sizes. But you know what they do? They also verbalize this with the fire department so they will be aware. So the key is to make sure you have that communication with the fire department so they will know exactly what the output of these hydrants are. So for my bonnets or my nozzle caps, this is the bonnet, these are the nozzle caps. AWWA says if you paint them blue, that's indicative of high flow greater than 1,500 gallons per minute. If my caps and, and my bonnet is painted green, then I'm looking at a flow from 1,000 to 1,500 gallons per minute, classified as A. An orange hydrant will give me a flow 500 to 1,000 gallons per minute. A red hydrant, less than 500 gallons per minute. When I say red hydrant, remember I'm talking the bonnet or the caps, nozzle caps. All right, for operation, use the proper wrench. Do not throttle, do not throttle, do not throttle. So when we are flushing, do you open them all the way? Good answer. Fully open or fully closed? Well, it'll tear up the neighbor's yard, or it'll knock the paint off of a car. That's what diverters are for. Attach that. Uh, and make sure, again, that you are closing and opening slowly. Here again, because of differential pressure, you don't have to put a lot into it for it automatically to go that route. And so when you are opening it too fast or closing it too fast, what's going to happen? Water hammer, job security. All right, yearly inspections. And again, if you look at the insurance, they suggest at least twice a year. Check for leaks. Uh, make sure you're cleaning, lubricating the thread nozzles. Check your weep hole. Make sure, again, they're not clogged. And make sure you're keeping records. All right, for a break, let's see if we can get it right. I need you to classify these hydrants. Is that a high flow, low flow, no flow? Less than 500 gallons. Look at my bonnet. Look at my nozzle caps. So what color is it? Green. That's green. That's green. That's green. Huh? That's a dark green? It's really green. Take my word for it. It's a forest of green. 
Yeah, so it's 1,000 to 1,500 gallons per minute. I guess that's the first thing we should do is agree on the color. Okay, what color is that? Blue. Blue, very good. High flow. That's green, you're right. That's a green too, that's a lime green. Out of service. How long can you leave them black? Do you all have a, a rules on that? No? Yeah, the black bag. We have a week to get it back. Okay, a week, that's good. Yeah, a lot of people use the black bags also or put the block on them. Um, how many gallons per minute? Super. Put I don't know. Why did I put I don't know? Because that's yellow and these are silver. That's confusion. And you want to make sure you don't have that scenario for your firefighters. All right, that's all I have on hydrants. Questions, concerns, issues on hydrants. None, let's take a 10 minute break and we'll come back at it.